OPLSS. <laughs> I've never done the very last lecture at OPLSS before. I was just telling Zena. All right. So um, we'll keep this light. <laughs> Not quite, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you tell me afterwards whether it's light or not. <laughs> OK, so um, where we left off yesterday was I showed you how to use uh, multi-language semantics in order to specify compiler correctness, right? And the whole advantage of this is that you can, um, with using this kind of proof architecture, you can link with things at the target level that you might not even be able to express in your source language, OK? Um, so I'd just like to go on, and I want to say, uh, you know, yesterday we did such a simple compiler pass uh, closure conversion for a uh, you know, terminating pure language, simply type lambda calculus. I just want to tell you, like, you might be wondering, how do I make a language that isn't quite so nice and simple, like the simply type lambda calculus? Like, let's take assembly and put that under a boundary, right? Suppose my source language S is some high level language, ML like, right? Some lambda calculus, and my target level language that I'm compiling to is assembly. How do we set up these multi-language boundaries? Do th are things even sensible? So I just want to talk very briefly for a couple of slides about some of the challenges that come up as you go further down the compiler and your languages become lower and lower level. All right, They become harder to think about, harder to reason about. They become harder to define multi-language semantics for, in a way. Um, OK, so uh, we already looked at you know, what happens when you go from an F-like language, which was simply type lambda calculus yesterday, to C, where we did closure conversion. Um, the interesting question that comes up when you do the next pass, so the next pass is uh, heap allocation. What you do is you take all of your functions, your code, and you take things like your tuples, and you have to lay them out in the heap. Because you're getting ready for a later stage in the compiler where things won't fit in registers anymore. Okay. So you need to reason about what sits on the heap, what data, big data sits on the heap, small data that fits in registers that's word sized, you know, that's, that's okay, that doesn't have to go into the heap. So this pass is heap allocation, it's trying to take all the data that is too big to fit in a register and get it to be in the heap. All right, so, um, so, so now think about this. I have my language C, which is the language closure conversion target from yesterday, okay? That was our target language yesterday. And now there's this heap allocation language. So suddenly, one of my languages has a heap, has mutable or has immutable or mutable references. And there's a way to allocate things on a heap, right? Yesterday, the operational semantics I was writing down was an expression E takes a step and goes to an expression E prime. Now you have to say, I have a heap and an expression. That's my program configuration. And I'm going to take a step, which means I might allocate memory as I go along, right? So it's just, we're, we're throwing more things in. Um, we already talked about that. Okay, so let's just look at what happens when you try to define semantics for that. Okay, this is a tiny little example. Let me just walk you through it. Um, so my green language is my heap allocation language. It has a heap. So I have a green heap there. There are a bunch of locations in it. And in this particular picture, I have a heap H. And in that heap, there is a location L that points to a tuple with one value in it, a single element tuple. Okay, that's what's sitting in my heap. And now I have this CA boundary, and I have reached a, that particular location. I have evaluated under the A boundary. A is my allocation language, the green language. And I need, I have a location, a green location. And I need to convert to the orange tuple type in the other language, right? So this is pretty easy. All I need to do is say, oh, let's go fetch that green value V, convert it using the appropriate conversion, just like we were doing yesterday, into an orange value, and then I just return that orange value in a tuple. Right? But look, now the boundary semantics is, it involves looking inside a heap. So in this direction, we're looking in a heap. Green language has things in the heap. So we try to go to the orange language, we're looking inside a heap to convert them. What's going to happen in the opposite direction? We're going to need to put things in the heap. Right? Now I have an orange tuple, and remember I said tuples are going to get allocated on the heap. They can't sit in registers. I mean, this example is very trivial. It's a one element tuple, but anyway. So I have an orange tuple. I need to take a step. I need to convert it into, some, into a tuple, essentially, in the green language. But my tuples in the green language sit on the heap. So what I have to do is I have to allocate a fresh new location, that green L, and convert the value and put it in there. All right? Does this bother anyone? Imagine that I have this orange tuple, the one with V in it, the orange V tuple. 
OK? I run this boundary once. I go allocate a new location, and I put the corresponding green value in that location. Then I, I'm sitting around. I have my orange tuple again, and I run the boundary again. What happens? You allocate again. So the same value, every single time you take it into the other language, you allocate a new location for it, and you put it there. Complaints? Comments? <laughs> <laughs> Something? Yes. Why is it good, or why does it not matter? Uh, sorry. Well, Yeah, so here what we're doing is we're saying that when I allocate a tuple on the heap, I'm going to treat that as an immutable reference in the heap. You cannot update it. If I was treating them as mutable references, then the fact that I'm taking, you know, that, that might cause more problems. That gets to be more tricky. Um, and here, big, the bigger point is, you might think that this is really inefficient. And it is inefficient, right? Same value being converted to, just to give it to the other language, I have to allocate a new set, a location for it every single time. I'm making like, you know, numerous copies of the same thing. Why am I doing that? Why can't I just share? The answer is that we could maybe be more clever and set up some sort of sharing semantics. But the reason we're setting up this multi-language semantics is so that we can specify a compiler correctness theorem. We are not specifying this multi-language semantics to actually go run it. I don't care whether it's efficient. I just care that the semantics is correct. Okay, so if you go at it from that point of view, if you wanted to all dou do double duty, if you also want this language to be something that you can practically implement, then you would design it differently. Okay, yes? V is what? Oh, uh, if that V is a location itself, then for that, another location will get allocated, yes. As part of the conversion from the orange value to the green value, um, you mean for the top line? Yeah. Um, if that green V is a location itself, then I would have to uh, convert it to an orange value, right? So then I would have to go read that location to get its contents, at least. I'm trying to do this on the fly. I think that's what happens. <laughs> okay, all right, so that's just a tricky bit about this phase. The next phase is far worse. So the next phase, Assembly comes into the picture. Now what I want to do, I want to convert, write, have these boundaries between A and T. And my T language is assembly. My A language, uh, it has lambdas and things, but it has this heap right, that I showed you. So now when, in, when we want interoperability with assembly, the question is, so my assembly is purple. right? When I design this AT boundary, look, I've put a purple E under it. What the heck is a purple E? I just told you my purple language is assembly. It doesn't have expressions. We all know what assembly looks like, right? Has a whole bunch of basic blocks, instructions, registers, word values that sit in registers. There's a stack, there's a heap, there's stuff like that, right? What, is, what corresponds to when you have a high level function oh, you know, in your nice functional language and you compile it down, what you get is a bunch of basic blocks of instructions. Right? So we don't have purple expressions. The very first question you have to answer is, what is a purple E supposed to, be, supposed to look like? Right? And I, the reason I'm writing E is because we've, always, we've had this notion of components. We put a component under a boundary, we run it down to a value, and then we convert it to the other side. So the other question is, when I, if I were to even tell you what that purple E is, it might be a bunch of basic blocks, how do I know when I'm done running the basic blocks and that I've now reached a value form, a purple V, that I can convert back to the other language? All sorts of interesting questions come up. Um, and then how do we define contextual equivalence for tau components, right? Not individual basic blocks. Um, and I won't get into the um, logical relation bit. But really the central challenge in desi designing the interoperability for this phase is that in assembly, you run a basic block, a sequence of instructions, and then you jump somewhere. And then you run some more instructions, and you jump somewhere else. You just jump all over the place. You don't really know when you're done running this function body. There's no return. Not really, right? Conceptually, there may be a return. So one of these jumps is eventually a return. Where is, where is that structure, that conceptual structure sitting? <laughs> right? If you just look at raw assembly, you don't have it. So, for us, things are better because we're using a typed assembly. But basically, there is this mismatch between high-level languages, which run in a direct-style fashion. There's a call-and-return concept. 
and between assembly where everything is just a jump, so it's a continuation style thing. And how do you bridge that gap? That becomes a difficult question. Um, I'm not gonna say, I'm just gonna give you a flavor of the kinds of things that come up. And if you wanna know more, you can look at our um, PLDI paper this year, um, which was about how you mix a high level functional lambda calculus, simply type lambda calculus like language with assembly. Um, for if you wanna know details. Okay, so I started with this question. What is a component in assembly, right? So conceptually, what should a component be? Well, if a component in our, in our high level blue language is this high level blue expression E, then the question is, what is the, what is the thing that I'm compiling it to? Because that's the corresponding component in the assembly, right? right? And what that looks like is, as I just said, is a bunch of basic blocks, right? So there's a first basic block where we're gonna start running, and then there are others in that component. That's what gets generated when your compiler produces this code. Okay, so I want you to think of this as a component, purple E, is a pair of a first basic block, which I'm gonna write as instruction sequence I, and then there's uh, some heap, the dotted stuff, which contains more of the basic blocks that I conceptually consider part of this component. Okay, so that's what a component is, a bunch of basic blocks. Um, okay. <laughs> Let me show you how we type check things in this tal. <laughs> this is like your um, five minute summary of, uh, you know, the highlights from system after typed assembly language, <laughs> okay? So it'll give you a feel, feel for what, wh how they set things up. Okay, so remember, let's start with my purple E. My purple E is a bunch of basic blocks, okay? I wanna type check it. The problem is, actually this is more than um, the typed assembly language in system F to tell because they did not have this concept of a component. That is what we are adding, that's, that's the thing in our paper. Um, so in their assembly, there was never a concept of a basic block returning a value. So they, they did not have type judgments where you could say basic block gives me back a tau, a result type, okay? And that's part of the problem. I want to treat bunches, a bunch of basic blocks as, you know, when I'm done running this component, I will return and I will return to someone with a value of type tau. So let's see what this judgment is doing, all right? So when we type check assembly code, and I want you to read that E as, as a bunch of basic blocks or one of them, um, what do we need? In the environment, we usually have a heap typing. It tells us all the locations in the heap that matter and what, the types, what types of values they contain. We have a normal type environment. This just contains type variables. You've seen this in high-level languages. We have a register file typing. So you know, just like we, in high-level languages, we have a gamma, right? Gamma tells us x colon tau. x has type tau. Now, those x's, there are no variables in assembly. Those variables are now essentially sitting in registers, right? They correspond to registers. So the register file typing is like our gamma, that chi that you're reading over here. This is essentially the gamma counterpart. It says register r contains a value of type tau. Okay? Um, then you have a stack type, because in low-level code we have stacks, so data sits on the stack. And the stack type tells me, okay, the stack looks like this. At the very top of the stack, there is an int, then there is um, maybe another int, whatever, right? And then maybe there's a pointer to some code, et cetera. Okay? So that's the stack typing. So given all of that information, um, we, want, we usually want to be able to type check assembly code, all right? Now, the thing that we added is this new concept of a return marker. We wanted to tell our components in the type system, so to speak, where it is, when I jump to a component, it, I wanna tell it where is its return address sitting. Okay, so I jump to a component, I'm going to tell it where it must return eventually. And we have this sort of discipline, right? Obviously when we compile high level code to low level code, right? If you have a function, you jump to the function, when you're done running it, you wanna return. Okay, so at the assembly level, I want to tell this component what location it must return to. Where is the return address sitting? I will pass it the return address either on the stack or in a register. That's why my return marker Q can be a register R or a stack index I. So all it is, I'm telling my component where to find its return address, right? There's also an epsilon, which I want you to ignore for now. All right, now, the way that I can figure out what the return type, tau, what this re result type for a component is, I basically go do this. I say, oh, the return address is in Q. Hmm, Q is a register R. Let's go look up the type of R. Oh, the type of R is the type of a code block that expects an answer in register R1. And let's say that's my calling convention. Answers are returned in register R1. I say, oh, what does R1 expect? 
So in other words, when I go to my, jump, to my return address, what type of result is it expecting in register R1? That is my tau. All the information is sitting in that typing judgment right there. I just walked through it for you. And we can fetch it. And we, we now know that when we return to that return address, it is expecting a result type of tau, you know, a result of type tau. And it's also expecting to see the stack in a particular shape. That's where we get this sigma prime, which describes what the stack should look like when we jump to the return address. Yes? I just did. Okay. I just did figure it out from Q and Chi. I'm just writing it over there. Okay. Yes, yeah. precisely. OK. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. And uh, sorry, I said a little bit of this. So the, uh, these code blocks normally look like it's just a basic block, an instruction sequence, but they have a precondition on them, which says the register file has to, and this is a type, the register file has to have type Chi, and the stack has to have type sigma when you jump to this basic block. It is safe to jump to this basic block if your register file contains values of certain type and your stack contains, has a certain shape, values of certain types. Okay? At assembly, everything is sort of preconditions. Okay. Um, I'm probably going to skip this. Do you want to know? Okay, let's see whether I can explain it. <laughs> okay, in a high level language, V at type tau and arrow tau 2. We set up a logical relation. We did this, right? The top line is not unfamiliar to you. I said to you, let's set up a value relation for at function type. And I said, what values do I have at function type? Ignore the W part. Um, so I have two lambdas. They are related. We said two functions are related. If you give me related inputs, I get related outputs, right? Related inputs to related outputs. That's the slogan. Now I have these code blocks. I have a basic block I1 over there sitting in the middle of all the mess, and a basic block I2 over there. And I'm trying to relate them. But I'm trying to relate them as what? So how do I actually relate them? Well, I want to say related inputs to related outputs. So here's what I want to say. I'm running two programs, right? I'm going to jump to both of them with related inputs. When do I want to get to my related outputs? Do I want to make sure that when, this, when these basic blocks, I1 and I2, are done running, I better have related outputs again. Yes? Yes? Does everyone agree? Do most people agree? <laughs> Does somebody think I'm throwing them a trick question? <laughs> Here's the thing. I want to be able to define a logical relation that lets me talk about equivalence of assembly level components. What is an assembly level component? What's the component in assembly? <laughs> Showed you a slide. <laughs> it's, it's a bunch of basic blocks, right? Some of them might be in the heap. So a component in assembly is not one basic block. And if I want component contextual uh, component equivalence, then I can't say that let's jump to these two basic blocks at the top, and at, by the end of that same basic block, I should get related outputs. Because that's not where I'm getting my output. Where am I getting my output? When the component returns to its return address. So somehow, we have to figure out, even though sitting in the logical relation itself, we only have two basic blocks, we have to figure out how to delay asking for the outputs to be related. You know, don't do it there. You have to do it there. At the end of the component, not at the end of the basic block. Because if, if you say outputs must be related at the end of the basic block, your notion of equivalence has become too fine-grained. And what I've just told you is the essence of the difficulty with assembly. All right? We, we go walk around saying this phrase, assembly is not compositional. The word compositional to you should mean, oh, someone's trying to think of components without having to think about other components. Um, but basically, the notion of what is a component in assembly is the difficult part, because assembly is such low-level structure that it doesn't lend itself well to that. And what I've just shown you is, is you know, basically tricky precisely because of that. I'm not going to go into why. Um, OK, so uh, I mentioned this yesterday that uh, Matt Klossick and Dustin and my student Max New are working on, you know, sort of extending this multi-language approach to down to assembly. Um, and they're also trying to sort of redo the multi-language design so that it's, it's easier to do proofs. All right. Let's take a second. <laughs> Switch themes. I'm going to talk about a lot of things today because <laughs> today is my wrap up. So I'm going to bring a lot of different threads together. Okay? It's not going to get much more technical than what you just saw. 
but we're going to bring a lot of different threads together. So I've been talking about compositional compiler correctness. I've been talking about how we want to be able to link with lots of code, right? Um, and that's the horizontal compositionality dimension. What can we link with? The vertical compositionality dimension is can we verify one pass of the compiler at a time and then get an end-to-end -end compiler correctness there? Okay, that's vertical compositionality. Now what I want to talk about is the fact that it's sort of a little bit about the fact that horizontal and vertical <coughs> compositionality are really at odds. Okay? They pull you in different directions. Um, okay, so right now let's talk about vertical compositionality. All three of these pieces of work, the Pilsner work, the compositional concert work, which uses interaction semantics, and the multi-language semantics work, all right? These are the good ones, right? Because sep concert just does separate compilation. Transitivity is not really hard <laughs> if you're doing separate compilation. If you're insisting, I will only link with the output of my own compiler. The word, the phrase compositional compiler correctness should mean a little bit more to you than just separate compilation. It means you're trying to link with something that didn't just come from your own compiler, okay? All right, so in the compositional compiler correctness world, where we're trying to link with things that didn't come from our compiler, um, transitivity becomes hard because we're trying to sort of make linking more. <laughs> you know, we're trying to increase on, along the horizontal dimension. The vertical dimension becomes difficult. Um, and basically, um, in Pilsner, Pilsner is very honest about proving transitivity, but there's a ton of proof effort that goes into proving that um, I have an SI cross-language relation, I have an IT cross-language relation, I, now I have a third relation, which they call ST, from source to target, and they have to show that these two put together, if I have a relationship between some code in SNI and INT, that I'm going to get the, those, the, um, that the relationship between S and T. Okay, that's a very hard proof for Pilsner. Um, compositional concert in multi-language, we both kind of cheat, and I talked about this at length yesterday, right? The way that we get transitivity is by essentially looking at what are all of the languages in the compilation pipeline um, and putting them together. Multi-language puts them together syntactically through language boundary. Compositional concert puts them together through interaction semantics by, abs by figuring out what is the semantic flavor of all of these languages. Let's construct one language that, that has all of those concepts and in memory invariance protocols. OK? All right. So transitivity is hard <laughs> when you're trying to do more linking. Um, now let's go back to this issue. Um, one of this, in my first lecture, I said, what are the properties of this ET prime that we want to be able to link with? Or what, what kind of thing is ET prime, right? And I said, ET prime could be the output of your own compiler, et cetera. It could come from a different language and so on. But let's ask this question, right? We want to be able to link with ET prime, with some other target code that is not, that has, a, that has some behavior that we can't even write down in our source language. Actually, let me ask it as a question. Do you want to be able to link with code that you can't express in your source language or not? <laughs> yes to both? No. <laughs> I want to know. I honestly want to know. <laughs> How many people think you should never link with, let's do the other one. How many people think that we should be able to link with code that we cannot express in our own source language? You guys win. All right. How many people think we should not be able to? Neil, <laughs> hey Young, <laughs> surprise. All right, who else? Come on, really? <laughs> no one else? Let me tell you what I think. I think you want both. You really do. I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not joking. You want both. Let me give you two use case, two usage scenarios for both, right? One I've already said yesterday. If I'm writing uh, some multi-language software, I'm using some sort of, let's say I'm using a domain-specific language, right? Or um, I want to write some component in that domain-specific language because it's easier for me to think given the type of code I'm trying to write. But this is not standalone code. It is a component of a large software system. Now I want to go link it with code that's written in another language that is far more expressive. I want to link with it, <laughs> right? Suppose that I write code in ML, and uh, let's assume this is some version of ML, you don't have call CC, okay? So you, you don't have control effects, you can't jump, all right? Um, now I can write a, a multi-threading library in Scheme. 
And what I want is I want, to, I want a simple implementation of like green threads, right? So I want it to be able to disrupt my component's control flow ev ever, every so often, right? And go off and do something else. That's a, that's a disruption of control flow. That is not a behavior I can write down in ML. But I want it. I want green threads. I want this kind of threading functionality. So I want to link with that threading library. People want to do this all the time. That's why you want to link with it. But of course, the vast majority of the room had their hands up when I said that, right? What is the reason for not wanting to link with it? And I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about just that in, in a little bit. OK, so. Um, uh, the only piece of work on this slide that allows linking with behavior that is not expressible in S is the multi-language semantics one, as I've already said. Um, compositional comps are technically does not because they link with all these languages that are very C-like. They all satisfy the compsert memory model. So, you know, all of those languages are sort of equi- I mean, you could, anything that you're writing at the assembly level, you can express somehow at the C level. Okay. That's conjecture, but I'm fairly sure. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, Okay, so what we really want to do, I would say, is build multi-language software. We want to be able to write code in languages that are very, very different, right? And I want you to think, this is the last lecture, the thinking lecture, um, <laughs> I want you to think about how we support that kind of scenario in a principled way, right? We want to be able to write some code in unsafe languages like C and C++. There's no notion of type safety even. And then we want to write other code in nice type safe languages like ML and Rust. And then even richer still, you know, we might have uh, code that we write in uh, Cox Galena or F star, right, dependently typed languages. These are very, you know, the richness of the type system is going up as I move across the screen, right? Um, we want to be able to compile them to the same target, but we don't want them to disrupt each other's sort of nice guarantees, right? Um, as soon as you link with C code from ML or from uh, Coq, you're basically saying, you, you should be worried <laughs> that the C component can write anywhere in your memory, right, once you've compiled down to the low-level target language. So <coughs> all the expectations that you had of type safety and good safe behavior are out the window because C can do anything, anything bad at all, right? So how do you protect yourself from that? And now what I want you to think about for a second is which of these three classes of languages are you writing your verified compiler for? Okay, so you're the verified compiler writer. You have to decide, you know, you're doing compiler correctness, correctness, right? So what properties do you want to preserve? I started out by saying we want to preserve semantics, right? So we want, when we run the source program and see certain outputs, we want to run the target program and see the same outputs, conceptually. Semantics preserving, behavior preserving. So for, I would, I'm, I'm gonna say that for C-like languages, it's enough to build a verified compiler that just preserves behavior. It's not a just, it's a very difficult thing to do, but just. But when you're compiling things like ML and Haskell and Rust, which are nice typed languages, maybe you want to preserve more. You don't just want to preserve behavior. You do want that. But in addition, it would be nice if we could preserve type safety guarantees, right? And information hiding guarantees. If you're compiling things like Coq and F-star, there's a lot of code written in those languages which is about, you know, you're verifying cryptographic protocols and things like that. You are making use of, um, you know, the rich type system enough so that you care about equivalence properties. You, you're not really getting security guarantees in that language if, you, if your equivalences are disrupted. So if you're writing a compiler for those, maybe you want to preserve equivalence. Otherwise, the Coq programmer, the code that they're writing, and verifying after you compile it down to the target, maybe it doesn't have that property anymore. I mean, after you link it with something, right? Their, their security guarantees might be disrupted. Yes, Max. Um, how does simply preserving behavior on the part of testing help you like, not interfere with the things you were talking about earlier? Like, how does that guarantee that your C code is just going to smash uh, whatever they were used in the top? That is the research challenge. <laughs> that is precisely the research challenge. So I'm showing you this picture because I want to say, how do we do that, right? Um, conceptually, what is happening is we are compiling down, right? C code is compiling to an untyped. You could, you could think of it this way. This is not what actually happens, but I'm saying we could think of it this way. Could we design a target language that somehow had the ability to do what you just said, to keep the untyped unsafe code 
from interfering with the typed safe code? Could we design gradual type systems? Hi, Ron. <laughs> So, so that maybe we could wrap dynamic checks around the untyped code so that any time it tried to go and clobber something in ML's or Haskell's space, we would keep it from doing that. That's very expensive with dynamic checks. So you can't just naively say, let's do gradual typing. Because there's, any time you do gradual typing, more typed language, less typed language. The way that you get the less typed language to behave is by wrapping it with dynamic checks. And now you're going to be building a compiler that is, has this huge performance overhead. There might be solutions to that, but you know, I have to think about it. So I would say that it's about principled language interoperability, and how do we get principled language interoperability? And I think there are lots of techniques out there, things like gradual typing and multi-language semantics and type-preserving compilation and all of these things that we can leverage. All right, and I'll try to give you a flavor for like how my group is sort of thinking about some of these issues. Um, okay, so. Um, now, I sort of want to question my own use of the word principled. What does principled language interoperability even mean? And this is back to the question of when I asked you, should you be able to link with behavior that you don't have in your language? <coughs> okay? So let's take scheme, compiling it, let's say, to this imaginary dynamically typed fragment of my target language, and I'm compiling ML. Um, now, do you want to uh, write an ML compiler that only preserves types? Or do you want to write an ML compiler that also preserves contextual equivalence? Remember I showed you fully abstract compilation the first day? Preserving contextual equivalence means if I have two source components and they happen to be equivalent in ML, right? my two implementations of the same stack interface, they're equivalent in ML, I, want, I would like it to be the case that when I compile them down to the target, they are still equivalent in the target, which means that awful scheme code that comes in from the side and links with my code can't tell them apart. Conceptually, what that means is that scheme code should not be able to do things that I can't do in ML. Right? Okay, so I've already said this actually. The no call CC, call CC example, ML does not have call CC, scheme does, and I could use scheme to implement a threading library, and I want to link with it. Right? So if I want to link with it, I can't, can't build a compiler that preserves contextual equivalence, because by definition, that compiler would have to disallow linking with that multi-threading library because that library is doing things that I cannot do in ML. That's the tension. Okay, so, um, but sort of a key thing here is at least you can tweak the knob. You, the compiler writer, when you decide what your type translation is, I'm imagining that you're compiling from a typed high-level language into some sort of richly typed target language. You can design your type translations to rule out certain linking, depending on what your, depending on what, that's the question. How do you, the compiler writer, decide which, which one to pick? Should I be preserving contextual equivalence? As in, should I allow linking with code that is expressible in my source or not? And who is the compiler writer to decide? What about the programmer? Doesn't this seem like a programmer-specific decision? Okay. All right. So let's talk about two big themes for the rest of, the, rest of my time. Uh, one is fully abstract compilation, which we often refer to as secure compilation because we think of it as, I don't want to link, link with target level attackers that can do things that can't be done in my source language. Um, and as I said, fully abstract compilation has to ensure that compiled code cannot interact with target behavior that you can't write down in your source language. Okay? Um, and then um, come to this question of, do we want to link with things, right? I've already asked this. And I've said that I do want both. I want to sometimes be able to link with code that I can't express in my in my source language, and sometimes I want the other thing. So let's see how we do that. Um, okay. Let's talk about fully abstract compilation. All right. So I've been showing you this picture of, you know, uh, we want to build compilers for a multi-language world where you can compile something, then you want to be able to link with drivers, or you want to be able to link with code from a different language. Um, but here's the thing: source programmers, do you agree with this principle that's up on this slide? Yes? Source programmers should be able to reason in the source language. A lot of you nodded vigorously. What does reason mean to you? Yes? Make decisions about behavior or improve things about behavior or sort of extract the line I call the principles or whatever. Right. Or be able to refactor your code. 
be able to sort of put in enough checks at the beginning of a function to know that you've protected against all sorts of the inputs that you consider bad, right? Okay, yes. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about what this word reasoning sort of often boils down to. I would say that it often boils down to contextual equivalence. In fact, I would say that it al always can boil down to contextual equivalence. A source programmer is never thinking of the phrase contextual equivalence. They haven't taken PL classes and thought about that concept. But, <laughs> but when a source programmer is thinking about, OK, so contextual equivalence, of course, you know what it means, right? These two components are indistinguishable in any source context at the type tau. But contextual equivalence is the basis for doing things like refactoring. Again, they're not thinking contextual equivalence, but they're like, oh, I need to take this code. I can refactor it into that code. The rest of the program should stay the same. That's an equivalence principle, right? Refactoring is justified if I just changed the first piece of code into something that should be equivalent. <laughs> OK. Uh, data abstraction, information hiding, uh, things like the stack implementation that I've been talking about, and, and also security guarantees, like I was just saying. I will, at the beginning of my function, maybe I'll protect, I'll, do, I'll insert some checks <coughs> to protect myself from certain bad inputs. But maybe other bad inputs I'll just assume never happen because the, the input types on my arguments say that you know, my arguments have a certain shape, have a certain type, and therefore I rely on that. That rules out a whole class of bad inputs, right, that I might consider bad and might need to protect myself from. So the type system is protecting me from them, therefore I don't need to insert those checks. All of these things that we do in programming boil down to certain principles, right? Reasoning boils down to contextual equivalence, even if we don't use the phrase. Okay? All right. Um, what does fully abstract or the secure compilation do then? It says that when we compile a source component ES to a target component ET and then link with something, it basically says that we want the guarantee that the source component will remain as secure Sorry, that the target compiled component will remain as secure as the source component was, even when it's linked with these arbitrary attacker, target level attackers. Okay? Um, which means they can't make any more observations, do have any more behavior than what some source context could. Okay, so it all comes down to expressible behavior. All right, so that's a tall order. What did I just say? I don't want to link with bad attackers that do things that I can't do in my source. How do we check that? There are a few ways. Um, technically, you could say that I can build an equivalence preserving compiler, right? So we have to ensure that we don't link with any behavior that we don't have in our source. Um, sorry, this, uh, this slide is a little too staged. Um, technically, I could prove that my compiler is equivalence preserving if I take all my bad target behaviors and just add them to the source. <laughs> How's that? You laugh, but there are theoretical results in the literature. OK, maybe about a decade ago. But the people used to do that all the time. Oh, we'll just add this feature over here and, and proceed to prove our theorem. <laughs> OK. <laughs> that also fits into my theme of not all theorems are equal. <laughs> Some theorems are not maybe worth proving as much as others. OK? <laughs> that is a the theme of these four lectures. <laughs> there's one thing you take away, please take that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we could add target features to the source. Very bad. <laughs> we could wrap dynamic checks around the, badly, around the code that we think might behave badly. Right? I just said this. We could use gradual typing types of things. We could wrap dynamic checks around our target context in a way, as a way to sort of monitor what the target context is doing. And as soon as it's about to go do something that it isn't allowed to do, we say error. We raise an exception. OK? Um, catching badly behaved code in the act. But this is bad because of? Because of? Overhead. Overhead. <laughs> exactly. Huge performance cost. All right. Third option, static checks. This is what I've been sort of preaching slightly. Um, you could rule out badly behaved, rule our, rule out <laughs> badly behaved code in the first place. You could just say, I don't want to link with it. But the way you would do that is by saying, OK, that code, um, I better be able to statically verify using either a type system or some sort of logic that it um, satisfies certain properties, that it won't behave badly. Okay? That's the verification approach or the types approach. Okay. If, so if you want to build fully abstract compilers and you want to do it in, without performance overhead, 
You want the static approach, <laughs> right? Um, people, people are trying to do actually a lot of the work on fully abstract compilation that's happening out there right now. People are actually using dynamic checks. But they're, um, what they're envisioning is that um, you know, these new kinds of hardware that are coming out, like Intel has a chip called uh, SGX, uh, Software Guard Extensions. Yesterday, someone was talking about capability machines. Um, it, with, with those hardware architecture features, you are able to do sort of security checks, in a nutshell, efficiently. And so maybe the overhead goes down, right? But the thing is, uh, on, on existing hardware, the overhead would be very high. All right. Okay, so I want to do type preserving compilation as a way of doing, uh, as a way of ensuring that, you know, um, that we can't link with bad attackers. And here's the actual property that we are interested in proving. If we have two components, E1 and E2, they're contextually equivalent in the source, then their compiled versions should be contextually equivalent in the target. And we need to make sure that the target, um, that in the target they have this translation type that essentially protects them from bad attackers, okay? Um, and fully abstract compilation, sorry, I said this on day one. It preserves, it's the property that contextual equivalence is both preserved and reflected, both directions. But it's the preserving direction that's the hard one. Can you tell me why the preserving direction might be the hard one? Going from, if these are equivalent, then the target is equivalent. Just intuitively, what's the reason? Yes? Yeah, lots of bad low-level contexts, right? That can do things like jump, go right anywhere in memory, that we normally don't, those features are not things we have in our high-level languages. Okay, so target-level languages are far more expressive and therefore harder to protect yourself against. All right, now I'd like to show you why building fully abstract compilers is so hard. Like if you wanna build a verified fully abstract compiler, there is, what do you have to prove, okay? And this proof is just, it's just gonna, I'm just gonna show you three steps. I want you to get the essence of what you need to do to prove this. So I have, I'm given these two source level components, right? They are contextually equivalent. That means that there is no target, uh, sorry, <coughs> there is no source level context that can distinguish those two source components. It's just in English what contextual equivalence means, right? That's what I know. What do I have to show? I have to show, given an arbitrary target context, I have to show this, this statement right, right here. The way I show this is I say, this statement says for all target contexts uh, CT, I should not be able to tell the difference when I plug these in, right? So what I need to show is you give me an arbitrary target context CT, I need to show that CT when I run, with, uh, run it with E1 <coughs> plugged into the context, I, I get the same result as when I run it with E2 plugged into the context. Right? Good so far? How many of you are awake enough for, to tell me what the next step is going to be? <laughs> what do I need to do in order to proceed? Mm -mm. So what do we have? We have a fact. The only fact, the only premise on this slide, the only premise to the theorem is there's no source context that can tell the difference between the source components, right? Now, but now I have a target context. Um, somehow I need to take my target context and show that this target context can be converted into a source context. If I could do that, then that means it can't tell the difference between the source components and then through semantics preservation you can come back down and complete your proof. Just trust me on that part, okay? But the next step is, I need to show that my target level context is no more expressive than any source context, right? That's how I'm going to proceed with this proof. I need to do a back translation. I need to somehow be able to say, given this target context, I, I have to show the existence of a source context that is semantically equivalent, behaves the same. It's like writing a decompiler or something. Only we don't want to write decompilers, right? So this is an issue of back translation. Every single proof where you are trying to say that this translation preserves <coughs> equivalence or this compiler is fully abstract, you will require a back translation. At least, maybe. Maybe there's some very strange, funny languages which are not very practical where you might not, you might be able to use a different technique, but usually you will have to back translate. Okay, so are you worried by now? How are we gonna take target assembly code and back translate it 
into source code in order to complete a proof? No way. <laughs> <laughs> Who said no way? <laughs> OK. No way. All right. <laughs> well, OK. <laughs> yes way. All right. Let's see what the idea is, why we should be able to do it if we set things up right. Um, there are techniques out there for doing this. Okay, so uh, let me just do a little bit of a history. So I, I want you to know what the state of you know the work in on the, in this area is right now. Okay, originally there were these techniques which were doing back translations. Um, essentially, they were talking about tra uh, compiler transformations where you go from a source to a target, and it just so happens that your target is no more expressive than your source. This can happen, right? N not every pass of your compiler is compiling to assembly, right? Closure conversion passes is a, a perfect example. In fact, my own first paper on this was closure conversion, system F with recursive types. We, d we showed that the standard uh, closure conversion translation is equivalence preserving. But the target didn't need to be any more rich than the source. So we said, oh, they're equi-recursive. We still needed to do a lot of work to actually take the, tar you know, uh, the closure conversion style context and turn it into <coughs> a source level thing, but we were able to do that by defining these wrappers, these back translation wrappers that, that essentially we could write in the same language to convert the low level thing of, of translation type into a source level thing of the type tau. So we were doing wrappers to convert between taus in the pre-converted code and tau pluses in the post-converted code. Okay? And then the same technique, because they had equi-recursive, uh, sorry, equi-expressive sources and target languages was used by this later work um, which is uh, simply type lambda calculus uh, with references to an encoding of JavaScript in that, okay? Um, the source and target were essentially encoded in the same language, so they were able to use the same wrapper <coughs> technique. But again, this, this boils down to back translation possible because, source, uh, because target is no more expressive than the source. And this already was considered a big achievement. But of course, it's not going to work if you're trying to compile down to assembly because it is more expressive than your source. Okay, so we need more work. <laughs> And there's more work if your target is more expressive than the source. So then there were these papers. Oh man, both of them are mine, sadly. Um, <laughs> okay, um, where we said, all right, we need the target to be more expressive than the source. But at the time, we were like, all right, let's start small. We'll stick with terminating languages. And we were able to back translate. Let me tell you in a nutshell um, how we did this. Basically, we said that the only thing you ever need to back translate has a translation type. So if my translation type is genuinely preventing me from linking with behavior that does not exist in the source, then maybe what I can do is I can take this expression, which is of translation type. Inside it, there might be, uh, there might be sub expressions that I could never directly write in my source language. But maybe I can partially evaluate them. Because I know that the results that I'm getting are of translation type. And that translation type result should be semantically expressible in the source. Do you get the idea? Partial evaluation inside the expression until you get some sort of expression where you are able to, where you have all these sub expressions which can directly be encoded in the source language. Okay? And it all comes from this nice insight of if I only have to back translate things of translation type, then I've already that been clever enough to rule things out, so now I, I should be able to do this back translation. Feeling happier? <laughs> Not quite, <laughs> it's still very baby steps. Okay, but how do you scale that to non-terminating? So I said partial evaluation, right? Partial evaluation, uh, in a nutshell, in a terminating language, this, this works out fine, but then you can't do back translation by partial evaluation because it's not well-founded if you're in a non-terminating language. This partial evaluation that you're doing inside of the sub-expressions might not terminate. Okay, um, the observation that we used in, in sort of later was, um, if your source language has recursive types, we're in a non-terminating language, right? My source language has recursive types. Then I can write an interpreter for my target and my source. So I'm going to back translate by writing an interpreter, essentially, for my. That's not literally what we did. I'm just saying that to, to give you intuition, OK? That an encoding should be possible because of that. All right, uh, I'm not going to go into details of this. If you want to know about, about this work, um, it's a technique called universal embedding. It was an ICFP 16 paper. You can look at it. Um, I just want to show you an example. All right, here is a closure conversion pass. My source language is non-terminating. It's simply type lambda calculus. My target language is polymorphic. It has exceptions. 
Okay, exceptions are a control effect that do not exist in my source. This is dangerous. I can't possibly back translate exceptions. I don't want to link with them. I don't want an exception flowing from the, that target code that I'm linking with across the boundary into my code, because I don't know what to do with it. All right? So here's an example. I have these two source programs. Lambda f, I take a function, I apply it to true, then I apply it to false, and I return unit. Here, I just do it in the opposite order. I take my function, I apply it to false, then true, then return unit. These two examples, are they equivalent in the source language? They are, right? Simply type lambda calculus. So what if it has non-termination? The worst that can happen is f terminates on tr either true or false. But it's just non-termination, right? So it doesn't matter which order you call it in. If f is something that terminates on true, then well, here it'll terminate just a touch earlier than here, but I'm not observing earlier, right? So these two are equivalent. All right, so they're equivalent in the source. Now we need to compile them to the target. Um, in the target, I can write down this context that can tell the difference between them. All this context is going to do, so there's a hole right here, right? Into that hole, I can plug in either E1 or E2. And what is the context doing? Well, it's passing in that function, lambda x raise x. That's my f. It's passing in that for the function f. So what happens? Lambda x raise x over here, uh, we end up raising true. So the whole program returns true. Over there, goes in, lambda x raise x, we end up raising false. Right? So these two are equivalent in the source, but they're not equivalent in the target because the target has exceptions. So you can tell the difference between them. All right. The way that you can protect yourself from this is, again, by using types. You use a modal type system that essentially says, I, I am a computation. Uh, and so we're going to have, we're going to say that in our target language, all computations or expressions have a type of the form of that form, where basically, if this expression runs and raises an exception, then it'll return a tau exim. Um, and if it does not raise an exception, if it does a normal return, then we'll get back something like this. But we are able, through the type system, to distinguish between exceptional returns and normal returns. OK? All right. So now the type system can tell me when some code raises an exception. That's the key. So if you have that, such a rich, uh, that kind of a type system, when you do this type translation from the source type to the target type, sorry, I'm writing div here instead of plus. These slides are part, we're part of a different thing. Um, all I need to say is that this translation needs to mean no, that this code can have no uncaught exceptions. By the way, I don't care if I link with target code that raises an exception and then handles it. That's totally fine. It's handling its own exception. By the time it, we, you know, we really interact and a value flows from it to me, there's no exception flowing across the boundary. So I'm fine with that. Right? I just don't want exceptions flowing across the boundary. So all I need to do is pick my translation type carefully. And what I do is I say, OK, um, all expressions of translation type are going to have this type. That 0 over there is the void type. So then what this type up there says, um, is that you know I'm only going to link with codes of tra code of translation type, and code of translation type must never throw an exception. Okay, and that's the value type. All right, so you can use this trick to basically build fully abstract compilers and do these kinds of proofs. And the trick is that here we picked a translation type, we compile the thing, so we prevent linking with code that's going to throw exceptions across the boundary. Um, and let's just go back to our example. We are going to make sure that it no longer type checks. Right? So I showed those two pieces of code that I showed you. Sorry, they were in black over there. But their type was bool arrow unit arrow unit. They were taking a, uh, a bool arrow unit function, the f function f, and returning unit. Right? And this was the evil context that I have sitting down here. Now I want to make sure that with the types I've picked, with the type translation I've picked, I will never link with this. Right? So let's see. When we translate that type tau, the blue one, into a translation type, that's what we get. Okay? We're going to say that a bool arrow unit function, it, since it was pure, is going to be a bool to zero, you know, void exception throwing um, computation. All right? 
So, in other words, I'm saying, oh, I only accept functions, bool arrow unit functions that don't throw exceptions. Now, that's going to be a problem, right? Because what is this context trying to pass in? It's trying to pass in a bool arrow non-void exception. It's trying to pass in a bool to e bool unit function, something that can throw an exception. So the types don't match up, and therefore we will immediately rule out linking with this context okay? by picking the right type translation. All right. Um, I've said that. So we use types to rule out linking. But now, back to the, to the question where I asked you to put your hands up. Um, what if we want to link with behaviors unavailable in the source, right? And I've already said that when we build multi-language software, surely we want to do that. All right. So surely we want to do that. Sorry, I've, I've actually said this. Um, you know, if you have a big multi-language system, you might implement, sorry, you might implement different parts of the system in different kinds of DSLs. I might have a terminating DSL to write my protocol parser, right? And I want it to interact. Okay, now, how do I reason about these things? How do programmers right now reason about these things? By the way, yesterday or the day before, who was it? Someone asked me, how, how can we do something where we can allow the programmers to reason at the source level without it was you, right? Um, without dropping down to the target. But the way the world is right now, in order for a programmer to understand the interaction between two components of the same multi-language software system, two components, one is written in a terminating language, the other one's written in a stateful language. So the source programmer wants to know, wants to somehow reason about the fact that non-termination, for instance, does not leak from there to there. Otherwise, you know, what's the point of having a terminating DSL? And right now, if you wanted to do reasoning like that, how do you do that? Well, if you have these embedded DSLs, you're in a host language, so you have to think about the host language. If you actually have uh, DSLs that are getting compiled down to a common target, then your picture is more like that. You're compiling these down to some common substrate, and that's where the linking happens. So, so then you basically have to say, oh, I have to understand the target language, what the compilers are doing, the target language, and linking at the target language in order to reason about whether non-termination is badly flowing from that language to that language, or from that component to the terminating component, right? OK, so this is a bad state of affairs. And we want to bring reasoning back to the source level. All right. So, um, so we just wrote this proposal paper on something called linking types, OK? Which hopefully might allow you to do something like this. It's uh, Snapple 17, and this is not like a body of work. It's an idea. Um, and we basically propose this thing called linking types, which are all about, you know, raising, uh, somehow allowing programmers to be able to reason in their language, even when they're trying to reason about scenarios like on the last slide. Okay? I'm going to try to make this a little bit more concrete so that you understand what linking types are, what we're proposing. Let me pause for a second. Any questions before I show you this? No? Okay. All right. OK, so let me try and explain what linking types are. Here's the scenario that we care about in a very simple setting. You have a pure language, the orange language over here, is simply type lambda calc with integers. Here, I have a language which is the simply type lambda calculus extended with mutable references. OK? It's exactly what I was saying two slides ago. I want to reason about the interaction between my terminating DSL and my stateful DSL. Okay. So, how do we reason in, I'm the orange language programmer, <laughs> the good orange language where everything terminates and is pure. Okay. I want to be able to think in my language and not have to worry about the other one most of the time. Okay. So, how do I reason in that language um, while linking with this other language? And you know, I've already said that refactoring is about equivalence. You don't need to say it again. OK, so here is an example. Suppose that I wrote this code. It is a function that has a counter, and it calls the counter twice. OK? And the type is of this function. It takes a unit arrow int function, and it returns int. OK? Um, now, I would like to be able to refactor it to this one where I call C once. Let me not say counter. Let me just say C. 
in the simply typed lambda calculus, which is what my orange language is, is it okay for me to do this refactoring? Yes, right? In simply typed lambda calculus, if I call a function c twice, or I call it once, it should not matter, right? So I should be able to take that code and replace it with a code that calls c only once. It should be completely okay, and the principle that justifies it against is, is because they are equivalent in my orange language, which is simply typed lambda calculus. Okay, so now, if we could build fully abstract compilers that could take you know, my original code and my refactored code, compile it, and ensure that equivalence is preserved, then I know that my, the refactoring that I'm doing in the orange language is still valid even after linking, after I compile. Right? That's what fully abstract compilation is giving us. It's giving the programmer the ability to reason in their source language. Right, and I pitch this two ways. Fully abstract compilation is preventing you from linking with bad attackers, so it's a secure compilation point of view. But now I'm saying it's much more than that. It's about programmers being able to just reason in their source language and knowing that nothing's gonna go wrong after you compile and link. Okay, so, but now let's say I want to link with Lambda Ref, right? So my world is not just orange language world anymore. I need to li link with Lambda Ref. Let's take a look at this particular example, right? And let's do it a little slowly. Um, so, I have up there a counter which takes a function f prime. What I'm going to pass in is the orange f for that f prime. So what is the orange f? It's exactly the code that I was showing you before. It's my orange language code that takes c and calls it twice. Okay, so when I say counter applied to f, basically that orange function is flowing into f prime. And what's happening in that blue code? Let's read. Um, I'm going to allocate a new ref cell, put a zero in it. That's my v. Then I'm going to have a new function, which I'm calling c prime. And whenever someone calls this function, um, it, it basically increments the contents of the ref cell. Okay, so when anyone calls c prime, what's going to happen? It's going to say, oh, let me go increment uh, whatever value is stored inside that ref cell, and then return the contents. Okay, so I'm saying v colon equals read out of v, add one, store it back into the ref cell, and return the contents. Okay, and then what we're doing at the very end there, f prime applied to c prime, we are taking the orange code, that's my f prime now, and applying it to that stateful counter. So what just happened? A stateful counter just flowed into the, the, the c that the orange code is expecting. Right? So that means I'm calling that stateful counter twice, so I get back a two. Correct? I refactor. I get back a one. Because now that stateful counter that's flowing in, and it's not flowing in from the orange language, right? It's flowing in from the stateful language, which has much more expressive power. It's flowing in, and this time I get back a one. So my refactoring is no longer valid. These two are no longer equivalent. If, if I'm allowed to do this kind of, you know, if blue code with references can just flow into my orange functions. Okay. So the question of is this refactoring correct depends on what I will eventually want to link with. Want to or not want to, be forced to, be allowed to, right? The <laughs> thing is the programmers don't have much control. So um, if I say that I'm, exe I'm expecting a unit arrow int function, an orange pure unit arrow int function, I have in mind a pure function. But what's happening, and there you know this refactoring is completely okay, but what happened there is a blue unit arrow int function flowed into my orange function. And if that happens, that guy can be stateful, and then my refactoring is no longer valid. Right? So, um, wouldn't it be nice if the programmer could specify which one they want? Because <laughs> um, if they could specify what they want, then the compiler just has to listen to them and preserve the equivalence that they say they want. I'm going to pause. It's a really big point. If I, the orange language programmer, could annotate my C over there and say, I only ever want orange unit arrow int functions to flow in, versus I'm perfectly happy accepting blue unit arrow end functions that are stateful. 
then what I have done by writing that down is documented what I am okay with flowing into my function. And if I've documented it, then that's the documentation I am now looking at when I do my refactoring. And I can think about whether my refactoring is okay. Questions? Okay. All right. So um, that's what linking types give you. For the entire orange language, if we could, if language designers could take linking into account and provide extensions that give programmers the option to sometimes, when they only when they want, to specify, oh, I'm happy to accept a blue unit arrow int function as input. Okay? So here's a linking types extension for that language. Um, and it's designed to allow linking with references. All right? So basically, it's the same type system, only now I have a type and effect system. So I have <laughs> references. Um, but I have a modal type system here, basically. I'm saying that functions can be functions that are pure, that empty set indicates a pure computation. Or functions can be something which have the lightning bolt on them, which means an impure or stateful computation. I'm trying to use this as a device to distinguish between orange unit arrow int and blue. Okay? So, uh, and you can do really fancy type systems which track effects like this, you know, using type and effect systems that are out there. Okay, so now if I have my linking types extension and I want to say which one, which function I'm, I, I'm happy to accept, I just have to put in this annotation versus this one. Okay, because this one says pure and that one says impure. So all I'm doing is giving the programmer a way to annotate that impurity is a thing, you might link with it, and you are willing to deal with it in certain places in your code. Okay, now, um, so now if I'm refactoring, and that's the annotation that I have on my code, which means that pure functions will flow in, then this is perfectly valid refactoring. Um, because what will happen is this evil context that we had before, right? Um, we have basically prevented it because look, my, f my orange function says I only accept pure functions as input, which means that when we try to pass it that blue C prime, it won't be allowed, right? This is ill-typed. Okay. So on the other hand, if I annotate it with a function that has a lightning bolt, then, then I'm saying I'm happy to accept um, these impure functions, which means that you know, the contextual equivalence doesn't hold and I cannot refactor and I should know that I cannot refactor. Um, and this will be perfectly fine because that orange function f is saying that it's happy to accept impure code, even though the impure code cannot be written in the orange language itself. But it'll come into the world, into the orange language's world after linking, right? Okay, um, so, and, and now, any objections? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. No. No. So here's when you need the red types or the pink types, whatever they are. Um, my orange language is the more impoverished, less expressive one. It doesn't have a concept of what a reference or stateful computations are. My blue language is far more expressive. It knows all about that. So if my blue language wants to link with um, orange code, if my blue language, if, if I want to give the blue language programmer the ability to say, oh, over here, I only want to accept, accept pure code, a different concept that doesn't exist in the blue language right now, then I will design a linking types extension for the blue language so that that programmer can say, I, I'm willing to accept pure, pure code and I will deal with it properly. Or I'm going to write a computation that will only be pure. But if I, if, if I don't want the blue programmer to think about purity, then that one doesn't need a linking types extension. Only the orange one does, because the orange one doesn't know about state, and the programmer wants to deal with state. Okay? So you only need to extend something if you don't already have it in the language. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> yeah? So what if I give you a pure language, and now you have to do another type system, to, or another type extension to put in the third language? So it all depends on what are the features in the third language. If the third language has features, many of them are, you know, it might be a completely very different looking stateful language. Syntactically extremely different. <coughs> but in terms of expressive power, all that line, third language has is state and my second language has state. Then I only need one stateful linking extension for my orange language. That's key. That's the only way this could possibly scale, right? But if my third language has features that my second one doesn't have and the first one doesn't have, then yes, I do need 
third, a, a different linking types extension. And there's a huge research question here. How do you compose these different linking types extensions and give the programmer the ability to opt into one and not the other? I'll talk about that in a second. And then the context, yes. Yeah. But how do you expect the program to also reason about the interaction between the two arbitrary features? Um, so I, what I'm saying here is that by designing a richer type system, which is designed precisely to reason about that interaction with the richer features, that's exactly you're giving a programmer a type system to to be so that they can think about it. Right? Before, they didn't have any sort of formal device to think about the interaction. And now they have these type annotations and a type checker that comes with a linking type extension, which can check things for them and warn them if they're not lining up. Yes? Yes. So there's been a ton of work on type and effect systems where we think about effect lattices, right? And they are effect lattices, so sometimes you know you need to be careful about which effects compose which way. It's not like you know you can pick two arbitrary effect and uh, effects and always know what the composition is going to. Anyway, um, but if you look at the work on F star, for example, and if you look at the work on Coca, we already have a lot of you know experience with designing type and effect systems that are able to keep different effects apart. Oh, benign in context, wait. Um, tell me, tell me what you mean by benign in context. Well, like, so for a for substance that you're talking about, right? Yeah. For substance you can fix it easily at the higher level level where it's actually like moved out of us. Yeah. But for something like mutation, if mutation is new, you just kind of have to affect like everything in the context, right? So how do you know whether the effect is actually you're talking about, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so you're down at the level of the call stack already, right? And there we're going to need very, very rich, rich, rich logics that reason about, you know, memory layouts and all sorts of things in order to be able to reason about the fact that if I, you know, try to do some sort of a store <laughs> into some heap location, I am not going to infect certain other things. But let's lift it up just a level, right? Because that is, that is a very hard problem. I think we have rich logics and techniques, um, you know very well, um, <laughs> where we can reason about those kinds of things. But if we get just slightly higher level, um, we can design type and effect systems that track whether or not some code mutates state, right? Read, write, allocation effects. You do this all the time. Right? So the lower level you go, the harder it becomes. That's for sure. Okay. So, um, so coming back to sort of the linking type source level, right? Linking types are now supposed to be a, something that a programmer actually uses, right? So it has to be done. There's a PL design aspect to this. You need to do it aesthetically. But anyway, I certainly don't want to suddenly force my source programmer to have to write down, before they were writing down unit arrow int, uh, sorry, unit arrow int, yeah, in orange, and now they have to like go do all of this red stuff, but they don't, okay? So you need to design these linking types extensions so that there is a default embedding. The programmer, unless they're trying to link with things that don't exist in the original language, they don't have to write any of these red annotations. That has to be a principle, otherwise no one's ever gonna use it, okay? And you can do that, at least for simple things that we've thought of, um, by doing this idea of a default translation, all right? So you have to be able to take all your orange language types and provide a translation into the linking types extension that does the right thing. Now look, my functions in orange are always pure, right? So when I do my default <laughs> translation, I put the empty, the pure annotation on that code, right? So the programmer doesn't have to actually write those down. Um, but, and the property that you want when you design this, this kappa plus default translation is you wanna make sure that if two things are equivalent in the pure language at a certain type, then at the default translation of their type, they are still equivalent. That's your principle that tells you whether you, you're doing the right uh, default translation or not. Okay? All right. Okay, let's sort of step back, conclude. Um, what are we trying to do? I'm going to talk about FFI. Um, so I started out by saying, um, you know, we're doing correct compilation of components. That equivalence relation specifies what we are allowed to link with. I've already said that, you know, a lot of the work that's out there, compositional comp search, sep comp search, pilsner, doesn't allow you to link with things that you can't express in your source, right? 
And again, I've said, I want to do that. <laughs> so, um, of course, the problem with wanting to do that is now your programmer won't be able to reason in the source. And that's exactly where linking types come in. So that's what I meant when I said, I want both. I want to be able to build fully abstract compilers so that the programmer can reason in the source. Okay? But I want to be able to link with things that aren't in my original source language. And by original source, I mean the orange language, right? I want to be able to link with something that is in the, that's coming in from a blue stateful language. And if I can provide, if we language designers can provide people with, with, with some sort of uh, extension that allows them to specify what they want, what kind of linking behavior they want, what they desire, right? <laughs> then the compiler just needs to preserve what they want. And we can build fully abstract compilers. That gives you the knob to turn. The programmer tells you whether to allow linking or not. The compiler writer doesn't. OK, so let's just talk about fully abstract compilation and the design of languages. Right? Big picture, very big picture. OK, so what do we do? Um, right now, we build these nice, strongly typed languages. We're very proud of them. We design ML. We design languages like Rust and Java. Right? Very nice type systems, good type safety guarantees. We're very proud of them. Now, then we have to write some code. <laughs> and we really want to link with that C library. <laughs> what do we do? Um, the problem is our language specifications for these original core languages, the thing that we think of as ML or Rust or Java, right? The core of the language, the thing that is actually type safe. Um, I would argue that that language specification is incomplete because it doesn't say anything about what linking you might want. And you always want some kind of linking. And so when we want linking, we design escape hatches, massive escape hatches. They're called FFIs. <laughs> CFFI, in Rust it's unsafe, in Java it's JNI, right? And what does that escape hatch do? Well, it lets absolutely every bad behavior in. <laughs> and you have no more guarantees, not really. You have no more guarantees anymore. At that point we say, the programmer we hope is thinking about things correctly. <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> that is what we do. Um, it would be nice if we could try to rethink PL design in some way to take linking into account, okay? Whether we do it with linking types or whatever else you want to call it, but some way of talking about linking um, so that we don't have to design these massive escape hatches. We can design like more, you know, principled escape hatches that, that support safe interoperability between languages. Okay, I'm going to talk through a few scenarios of, of mixing languages and what you might want to do. Um, if you design a linking type extension. So if you have ML, right? Um, and I want to link with, let's say, Scheme. And what I'm assuming here was the same example as before. Let's say ML does not have call CC, Scheme does. Okay? And I want to link with that threading library that I told you about. So I'm the ML programmer, and I want to link with that threading library. So if we could provide the ML programmer with a linking types extension, that's what this dotted thing is supposed to be, that has a concept of continuations, first class continuations, okay? Then they could actually write down specs that say, oh, yeah, here I want to link with the threading library. And by the way, when you design these linking types extensions, you have to do it in a way that doesn't match the way this concept, this behavior is talked about in the other language. It has to feel natural to what your language is. So this is a design problem, okay? It's the feature, the behavior that matters, not how it's implemented in the other language, not, not the syntax or the particularities of how it works in the other language. We want to abstract away from all the other languages so that we can be, allow programmers to think in almost their own language. Okay, um, and now the key here is you only need linking types extensions to interact with a behavior that's inexpressible in your language. So if the same behavior occurs in multiple other languages, as I already said, you don't need to you know, keep layering on more and more extensions. Um, okay, suppose I want ML to interoperate with Rust. What does Rust have that ML doesn't? Ownership. Ownership, yeah. Ownership, affine types, essentially, right? So we would need to design some sort of affine linking types extension so that we can tell ML or give the ML programmer a way to say, oh, I'm willing to accept things which are, you know, affine that I have to treat linearly, essentially, and I will do the right thing. I will not duplicate them. You're adding to the ML type system's power so that you can get that guarantee during that interaction. 
Um, how about Rust's unsafe? <laughs> Rust has unsafe right now, right? Rust's type system is designed so that it's easy to use for programmers, but occasionally you need to go in and do something really nasty, and at that point you have to write some unsafe code. And what is nasty? Well, let's say you have a big hash table and somewhere you, know, you have a sort of lock on the whole thing, um, but now you need to go right in one little cell in the middle of that. Well, you're going to have to switch to unsafe code and do that. Okay? And at that point, you're just trusting the programmer to do the right thing, mostly trusting the programmer to do the right thing. So maybe we could do that, deal with that by designing fine-grained capabilities. And a linking types extension that can talk about fine-grained capability. The programmer, of course, has to move to a more complex level of reasoning, a more complex type system. But hey, they're moving to unsafe already. So maybe those programmers who want to do these kinds of things are exact, are precisely the ones who are willing to move to a richer type system to do that kind of reasoning. Um, OK. So then if we could do all of this, we could maybe try to build fully abstract compilers, because we have the concepts available in the high-level language. Um, and of course, there's, this is like a massive you know, sort of um, research vision, like, can we do this kind of question? Um, can we design low-level type RRs that keep these effects separate from each other? Can we then compile to existing compiler backends like the LLVM, right? And you can. So, so the assumption here is that if you take components from all these different languages and you compile them to this type IR, that intermediate language that I have up there, and that does the right thing and is able to keep all the effects separate, now at that, in that language, you do all your linking and you have a whole program. Once you have a whole program, no other bad code is going to come into the picture, so you don't need types anymore. You can erase them all. Okay? So you can erase all your types when you go from that to an untyped, let's say, LLVM backend. And then in the LLVM backend, you can do whole program optimizations <coughs> like you currently do. Okay. Um, oh, I threw Galena in there. Uh, yeah, you, if you wanted ML to interact with Galena, you need to give ML, you know, you need to enrich your typed IR with dependent types, and it goes on. <laughs> There are too many features out there, but maybe we should start thinking about them in, in good ways. Um, OK, so um, the key of what I've been saying is you know, I, like this, this kind of idea of a linking extension supports fully abstract compilation, and it allows programmers to reason in almost their language. Um, that's the idea. All right. I don't know what I have after this. Do I have something after this? Oh. <laughs> My line. Um, I think you've heard enough of that. Hold on one second. <laughs> Um, I think the last bullet is really the only one that needs to be said. We need to rethink proof architectures for compositional compiler correctness so that we can support um, linking with arbitrary code, but allow programmers to reason in their language, I think. Anyway, thank you very much. Hey, I'm on time. <laughs> <laughs>